In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's Report today, since we are at the FFA convention, I thought it was only appropriate that we do something with more of an agriculture leaning. And the truth is, that wasn't even something that was very difficult to do. I think that it is a profound truth that part of the reason that God structured his word in the way that he did is because he wanted to make it accessible to the average man. So that the everyday working person, somebody that worked directly in agriculture, whether it be growing crops or taking care of animals, that they could relate to it. And for the longest time throughout human history, even if you weren't somebody that did that, even if you were, for example, a merchant or in the Jewish tradition, a priest, you were still around that kind of lifestyle and you were still around people that lived that lifestyle on a regular basis. And because of that, it was very relatable, very easy for you to understand when God would use a truth about nature, about agriculture, to illustrate a spiritual truth. And that is no exception in this next passage that we're going to go ahead and look at from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, verses 4 through 7. And this is Christ speaking where he says, What man among you, if he has a hundred sheep, has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open pasture and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep, which was lost. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. This is a, of course, very famous passage, and one that has a powerful message about Christ and his love, for his children, for those that are in the family, that are part of the body of Christ in the church, and the great compassion he has for those that unfortunately have not joined that body yet. That he has a great deal of concern for those that are lost because he cares about them, he wants them to be a part of that fold. But it also says something else too, and this is something that Christians revere, and rightfully so, but to the point that I think a lot of people don't really understand. Did you know that in the early church, and especially because they had to do a lot of hiding, they couldn't really be very vocal about their faith, or at least not as public about it. They certainly did preach, they certainly did spread the gospel, but they were a little more cautious about the way that they shared it than we are today because they didn't have religious freedom and they knew that they could be thrown in prison for it, and many of them were. Many of them suffered greatly for trying to spread the gospel. But the point is, they did have sort of codes, and they had sort of ways to let other people know, yes, I'm a member of the church, and because of that, you can trust me. You don't have to watch, you, you don't have to watch your speech around me. This is something that I want to talk about, that I can talk about. And so because of that, imagery became very, very important to the first church and different images projected different aspects of Christianity. But you know what the most famous image of the early church was? What image that they liked to use the most to convey that they were people who had obeyed the gospel? It wasn't the cross, because at the time, Rome was still crucifying people. And so it would be very strange for you to wear a cross around your neck. I mean, to put it in modern day terms, it would be like wearing a lethal injection syringe or wearing an electric chair on a necklace. They, that wouldn't make any sense to them. And so it would be something that would be very odd, very off-putting, and so they didn't use the symbol of the cross until much later. A symbol that they used earlier, but not quite as early, is the Jesus fish. The, you know, the common design that we're all familiar with, and that comes from the story of, of Christ saying that he was going to make his apostles fishers of men. That was an early symbol, and certainly an important symbol, but it still wasn't the most popular symbol 
of the day amongst Christians in the early church. The image that was usually depicted as the, the symbol of Christianity back then was the image of Christ carrying a lamb on his shoulders. And there are several reasons for that, because Christ not only refers to himself in this parable from the Gospel of Luke as the Good Shepherd, but he also portrays himself as being the Lamb of God himself. And so there's almost a dual use here of using an image of a man carrying a sheep upon his shoulders. But we're going to focus more on the one of the lost lamb since that's the passage that we just looked at. There is something very powerful and something very comforting about knowing that there is a God out there, that there is a Savior that cares enough about you to leave the comfort of his own flock. I mean, you've got a hundred sheep. And you could, at least from an economic perspective, say, well, it wouldn't make any sense to leave the 99 you've got to look after the one, to go after that one that's missing. You've got plenty of sheep. You don't need that other sheep. And, and that, that sheep, you know, that might even be one that gets lost again. That might be one that doesn't stay around. It may not be one that's going to be all that productive. None of that matters to the Good Shepherd. You see, the Good Shepherd sees a sheep that is lost and desires to save it. Now, there is a little bit of difference here between the parallel and, and what is actually going to happen in the church. Jesus doesn't save anybody by force. He doesn't drag them back to the pasture. But any sheep that wants to be saved, any of his lost lambs, he gladly welcomes them back. He seeks them out. He wants them to be a part of that fold. He desires their presence in the godly kingdom. And so because of that, he leaves the ninety and nine because he knows that they're secure. He doesn't leave them unguarded. He knows that the main thing that he hates to leave is that he's leaving their presence to pursue this lost lamb. Kind of like the prodigal son, which is another parable that, that has some implication here. But let's really focus in here that we have a God that loves us enough to leave comfort, even though he doesn't need another sheep per se, he doesn't need our presence, he doesn't need our love, but he still desires it enough to go after us. He desires it enough that he risk his life, he risk his safety, and Jesus did that when he came to earth as a human being, that he risk everything he had to just have a chance to rescue that lost lamb. And when he finds that lost lamb, he doesn't just pick it up sort of in a nonchalant way, in a way that the animal might be injured. He doesn't, you know, just smack it and, and make it walk home itself. He doesn't put a halter on it and drag it home. No, no, no. He's a good shepherd. And because of that, he takes the lamb up, puts it over his shoulders, drapes it there, and carries it on his back home. And isn't that really symbolic of the relationship that we have with Christ? I mean, yes, we have to take the first step. We're the ones that have to obey the gospel, do the will of his Father, do the things that he asks us to do. But ultimately, we're still not the ones doing the heavy lifting. It's not our works that are earning our salvation. It's Jesus Christ that says, no, 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 this lamb is lost. I'm going to do the heavy lifting. Do we still have to be found? Sure. But it is ultimately Christ that picks us up and wraps us around his neck and carries us all the way home back to safety. And the way that that passage in Luke ends is that there is great rejoicing, that even the angels of heaven sing and are thrilled, are, are so overjoyed that they break out in song at the one lost lamb coming back home. After hearing that, there's no reason, there, there's no doubt in my mind and, and no uh, wondering left as to why this image of Jesus carrying his lamb home was a powerful symbol for the first century church. And maybe it's one that needs to be revived by the modern Christians because there is no greater symbol of love than somebody that is willing to go out and rescue you in your plight. And that's exactly who Jesus Christ is for us. Stay the course, friends.
you know, you really should like this video and subscribe to the Tactics YouTube channel. Oh, what's that? You want to know what's on the channel before you subscribe to it? Oh, no, 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 it's like Obamacare. So you got to subscribe to find out what's on it.